in manufacturing and broadcasting. Yeah, I think they'll help your students. Uh-huh. Hey, listen, I gotta go. I'll call you later, okay? Bye, Frank. Oh, Frank's the reason I'm here. He said he'd leave some papers for me? Yeah, he did leave them here. I, hey. I don't know where they are, though. The dark. I thought oh. you knew all about them. numbers. Why is this chart out? Oh, that's for Frank. He may use it in his class. You and Frank really get into numbers, don't you? Sure. I thought you said the number system was simple. Looks pretty complicated on here. It's not that complicated. Basically... We just have a line with uh, sections sectioned off for whole numbers. And this part of the line starts at zero and goes on forever in that direction. Great scheme, huh? <laughs> you really love this stuff, don't you? I guess I do. It's really amazing, though. These numbers that are in the whole number spaces, there are just as many of those, say, uh, in between zero and one, as there are possible along this whole line. They're to infinity both ways. Ideas like that are the kind that I understand, but I don't really understand, you know? Try this. How many whole numbers do you know? Oh, like 2, 12, you know, 200. I never really thought about it. How many fractions do you know? <laughs> Who knows? Probably a lot if I tried. That's it. Nobody knows. Whole numbers are fractions. You can have as many as you can name. Forever and ever. But nobody's ever named them all. No, they haven't. But each point on this line has a specific name. Yet that same point can have an indefinite number of other names. Well, that's not so strange. Most people have several names. Well, like sometimes I'm called Todd, or my kids call me Dad, or my dad calls me Son. Exactly. My wife calls me Dear, or some people call me a uh, Number Doctor. Probably other people have names for me I just do not know about. <laughs> me too. And numbers are the same way. Take this one, for example. It could be 1, it could be 1 over 1, 2 over 2, 3 over 3, and so on. It can have a lot of different names. And the same is true for two or three or any number. Right. Except that sometimes people get into trouble when they call something by name it isn't. For instance, if I call you Bill, you wouldn't answer, would you? I don't get it. Do you know what a Bactrian is? No. It's a two-hump camel. Oh, well, I know what a two-hump camel is. Okay. Say we call the humps legs. How many legs would a Bactrian have? Are the legs still called legs? Hey, no more help. What's the answer? <laughs> well, there could be two, or there could be six. That's a mistake most people make. No matter what you call them, humps are humps, legs are legs. No matter what you call the humps, the factory still has four legs. That's pretty sneaky. That's it. Hey, arithmetic, algebra, any math I know, it's always the same. As long as you call it quantity by what it is, you're okay. But as soon as you try to call it by some other name, you're in trouble. That's why you can't add apples and oranges. Right. Let's see uh, how we would add fractions with different names. For instance, uh, one-half and seven-eighths. We have to change the name of one-half. We can change the name, but not the quantity. Right. We don't want to mix the legs with the humps. Right. Now, one-half is the same as four-eighths. So, four-eighths plus seven-eighths equal eleven-eighths. Do you see eleven-eighths on this line anywhere? Well, it's more than one. And it's less than two. Right. Is that it? Right. You notice that it's the same point on the line that one and three-eighths is. Oh. So eleven-eighths can be called one and three-eighths, and it's all the same. You got it. It's a pretty slow way to get an answer, though. That's right. But that's... This is just for demonstration. Okay. Uh, but one thing you have to remember. You have to change the name. Because we cannot have an improper fraction for the final answer. What I mean when I say improper fraction? Well, it's they're not they're they're expressed improperly, not in their lowest terms or simplest form. Right. Let me show you the board. We have our eleven eighths. This line means to divide. So eight into eleven will go one time with the remainder of three.
express it. One, three eighths. But why the three over eight? It's that line again. Three over eight with a line means divided by. It. Oh, I got it. Let's try something else on you. things here we call eights, right? Right, eleven eights. Okay, now we put enough of these together to make one the same as eight eights, right? With a remainder of three eights. Right. So, what we're saying is eleven eights is the same equivalent as one and three eights. That seems like a pretty good way to explain mixed numbers. Right. Mixed number is a whole number and fraction. This stuff's starting to get to me. I'm going to get out of here. Hey, we never did find those papers that Frank left for you. Well, that's all right. I'm sure they'll turn up sometime. Yeah. So long, David. Well, bye, Todd. Well, let's hope they do. But with their being on David's desk, who knows? Hi, I'm Steve Wise, and it's good to have you back for another adult math program. Here are some things you should remember from the little talk David and Todd just had. Mixed numbers are most often expressed as a whole number and a fraction, as in four and three-fourths, or four and five-eighths, or any combination of those numbers which fall on the number line somewhere between each whole number. Take a look at this number line. Though it is a little simpler than the one David has, it shows the same thing. For every whole number, one, two, three, four, there are uncountable mixed numbers located between each whole number. For example, if you look at the space between the whole numbers 1 and 2, you will quickly see that there is a whole world of new mixed numbers that exist in that small space. Also, you can remember that any point on a number line can have several different names. In fact, it can have an unlimited number of names. Let's take the simple number line again, for example. That spot on the number line, which can be called 1 and 3 eighths, could also be called 11 eighths or it could be called 22 sixteenths, and so on. However, 22 sixteenths is not reduced to its simplest or lowest term. 22 sixteenths can be reduced to 11 eighths, but it is still an improper fraction because the numerator is larger than the denominator. Remember that the line between the numerator and the denominator means to divide. So 11 divided by 8 equals 1 and 3 eighths which again is just another name for the same location on the number line. Well, I hope that's helped to clarify things some. Now let's get back to the Adult Ed Center and see what's going on. Todd picked up his envelope. He was here, but I couldn't find that stuff anywhere. Hey, you want some coffee? Sure. Thanks. Say, are those the slides there you're going to dig out for me? Yeah, I got them all ready. Hey, might take a look at them, and you can pick out what you like. Good. Here, I'll hit the lights. I'll take care of the projector here. There we go. A number line, again. Here's another version. Okay. Now, wait, let's look at this one. It wouldn't hurt my class to hear some more about estimating. Yeah, it's a good idea to remind them. You'll probably want this one next to C. Good idea. Yeah, unlike denominators. Just plain unlike denominators don't bother my students much anymore, but uh, this is adding mixed numbers. That's different. These will make them think about estimating before they work the problem, too. Mm -hmm. What's next? 4 1 4 plus 2 and 3 fourths. 
you have to deal with this uh, whole number. Regrouping, you mean. Mm -hmm. This next one should follow logically. Yep. What happens when you add and the answer is more than the next whole number? Yeah, that's good. Another kind of regrouping. Now listen, if I need it, do you have one that deals with subtraction of fractions with unlike denominators? I should have one here somewhere. Probably wherever you hid Todd's envelope. Hey, not funny, Frank. Well, let's see what we've got coming up. Okay, here's subtraction and regroup. Uh-huh. Make the four and one fourth into three and five fourths, so you can subtract three fourths. That's a good one for review. Well, here's the one you were talking about. See, I told you I had it here somewhere. Well, these ought to help a lot, David. That's it. Welcome to any of you like. Well, thanks a lot. Hey, here's that envelope I left the pond. I knew it was here somewhere. Mm -hmm. And this is that poster you were telling me about? Yep. Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah, that ought to make the room look a whole lot better, even if nobody ever understands it. Hey, they're going to understand it, Frank. You think so, huh? Sure, with a little bit of explaining. Yeah. Okay, here goes. This poster demonstrates what we call a number line. Now, this line doesn't really exist anywhere. It's just a way of explaining how our number system works. Perfect so far. Now, one very important thing about this line is that it shows that numbers go on forever in both directions, clear to infinity. Now, you might want to explain a little bit more about that, them going in both directions. Okay. This minus one shows that negative numbers, numbers that are less than zero, are also on this number line. Negative numbers are part of our number system, and they also go on forever. As many negative numbers as we can name. At regular intervals, on and on forever. Right. And same thing is true for the positive numbers, the numbers that we usually talk about, one, two, three, and so on and on, until we can't even think of any names for them anymore. Good. I don't think they'll have any trouble understanding that. Good. Now for the fraction. <laughs> now, between every whole number on this line, say between 1 and 2 or 4 and 5, are an infinity of fractions. Good. Now, once again, we can't write down all of the possible fractions that there are because there simply aren't enough spaces. But these fractions exist in our number system, and if we could name them all, they would extend clear to infinity. So the number system has endless whole numbers and endless fractions. And the fractions help us to talk about pieces of whole numbers or sharing. Right again? We can use this number line to help us when we're working with fractions. Now, that's important because most of them are going to want to know what difference does all this stuff make. Yeah, they nearly always want to know that. Well, what I'll tell them is this. Say uh, you're trying to work with one-fourth. Well, by looking at this, you can see that one-fourth is the same as, or just a different name for, two-eighths, or three-twelfths, and it. so forth. And this means uh, that, once again, we have all kinds of names for what is really exactly the same spot in our number system. Well, that sounds fine to me, Frank, except you didn't mention the different names for regular numbers. Oh, yeah, I suppose I should have done that earlier. You know, it wouldn't hurt anything, I don't think, if you put it, you were talking about fractions. You think so? I think it'd be fine. Well, let's get this thing down to the classroom and let you give it a try. Okay. You really think I explained this okay? Oh, sure. Of course, once you get classroom, they'll ask you a bunch of questions you never thought of before. You're going to have to scramble around to find the answer, <laughs> but that always happens. What you should have gotten from this scene is that regrouping of fractions is sometimes required in adding mixed numbers. In regrouping, you express a new whole number in fraction. For example, 4 and 1 fourth plus 1 and 3 fourths equals 5 and 4 fourths. 4 fourths is the same as 1. Therefore, 5 and 4 fourths would be equal to 6, the new whole number. Another example would be 6 and 3 eighths plus 5 and 5 eighths equals 11 and 8 eighths. 8 eighths is equal to 1. Therefore, 11 and 8 eighths is equal to 12, the new whole number. Now, subtraction, the inverse or backwards of addition, sometimes requires you to do the opposite. Let's take 6 minus 1 and 3 fourths, for example. Since you cannot subtract a mixed number from a whole number, you must change the whole number to a mixed number. 
Now, since we are dealing in fourths, one would be equal to four fourths. You subtract one from the whole number six, and you are left with five and four fourths. Now we have two mixed numbers, five and four fourths, and one and three fourths. They can now be subtracted to get the answer of four and one fourth. Another example of this would be five minus three and two fifths. We can call five four and five fifths, and then subtract. Four and five fifths minus three and two fifths is equal to one and three fifths. When we change the whole number to a mixed number, we aren't changing the value, just the name of that number. I must caution you, though, when dealing with mixed numbers. You can get different expressions for the same numbers, but be sure when you say one expression equals another that it really does. Remember, no apples and oranges are humps and legs. Now let's look in on Frank's class and see what's going on. Okay, let's uh, work through this together, and if you have the slightest question, you stop me, okay? This tells us that we are to add 4 and 3 fourths plus 2 and 7 eighths, but we don't have the same denominator, so we must find the common. Now, in this case, it's eighths. It says that 4 and 3 fourths equals 4 and 6 eighths. Now, Bill, how do we find that common denominator? You can multiply both terms of the fraction by the same number. In this case, uh, multiply both 3 and 4 by 2. Right, and everything comes out even. Okay, 4 and 6 eighths plus 2 and 7 eighths is 6 and 13 eighths. Everyone agree? Right. All right, now notice this is another one that asks us to estimate the answer. Do you all believe that 6 and 13 eighths is somewhere between 6 and 8? Well, yes, it is, but... I just don't see how you knew that it was going to be between six and eight. Well, Mark, the only way it could be more than eight is if, or eight, is if four and six eighths were as big as five and two and seven eighths were as big as three, which Wait they are Wait a second. Aren't. Slow down, Todd. Both numbers are smaller than what they would need to be to make eight. Oh, okay. So it couldn't be eight. And one number's larger than four and the other's larger than two. So it couldn't be less than six. That's right, Todd. And that's excellent. I couldn't have explained it any better myself. Thanks. You got it, Martha? For the moment, anyway. Well, let's go on. If we need to come back, uh, we can, okay? Bill, what's the next step? Well, that says that six and thirteen eighths is the same as six plus one and five eighths. Everybody believe that? And it, it shows how they got the one and five eighths. Thirteen eighths means thirteen divided by eight. Well, that would be one with remainder of five, which is one and five eighths. Mm -hmm. And you combine the whole numbers and it gives you seven and five eighths. There's another way. What is it, too? Well, in 13 eighths, just subtract eight from 13, gives you five, and call it five eighths. That's right. All we're doing is subtracting eight eighths, right? Mm -hmm. 13 eighths is five eighths more than one. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So our answer is seven and five eighths. Okay. Subtract. Now, we haven't talked very much about subtraction. Uh, you all know that subtraction is the backward or the inverse relationship to addition, right? All right. Now, this slide shows us the inverse relationship to the example that we just had. Uh, now, remember, if you get somewhere by addition, you can get back to where you were by using subtraction, right? All right. So, 7 and 5 eighths. Well, uh, who would like to show us each step? Well, I can do it, I think. All right, Martha, tell me. Uh, four and three-fourths can be called four and six-eighths, which is what they've done here. Now, six-eighths is larger than five-eighths, so what you have to do is regroup the seven and five-eighths. Now, I can take one from seven and call it uh, eight-eighths, and then I add that to the five-eighths, which gives me thirteen-eighths, or rather, 6 and 13 eighths. Sure. Now, 4 and 6 eighths subtracted from 6 and 13 eighths gives me 2 and 7 eighths. Is that it? That is definitely it. <laughs> that is super. And all the rest of these examples are just different expressions of the same thing. Now, who can give us an example where we can use this kind of computation? Well, I think I can. Uh, 
down at the paint store where I work, we sell paint in gallons and quarts and pints. And they'll buy, you know, buy some paint and won't use all the pints, and then they'll bring it back to the store to exchange it. I guess we're lucky that a pint is one-eighth of a gallon. Huh? <laughs> right. right. Well, take this problem, for example. Say on Monday some guy brings in, oh, four gallons and six pints of paint to exchange. Tuesday's my day off, and he brings in more while I'm gone. When I come back on Wednesday, there are six gallons and 13 pints. By subtracting, I can find out how many he brought in while I was gone. Excellent. Good example. Have you got any more to cover the rest of these? Oh, sure. Uh, say somebody pays, pays for six gallons and 13 pints but we only have four gallons and six pints in stock. Well, I need to subtract to find out how many we still owe. Now, knowing we need to subtract is the hard part in real life, isn't it? Right. There aren't any plus or minus signs. Well, then how do you figure out what operation to use? Well, I, I sort of go by words. If it's uh, how much is left or how much more or what's the difference, then I know I need to subtract. But in a situation like Todd's, there aren't any words like that. It just takes experience. Then. You know, I had some like that come up the other day. I bought a piece of copper tubing, six feet long, and I used two and a half feet of it in the garage and two and three quarters feet to fix a kitchen sink. Then I needed some of it for the furnace, and I had to figure out if there was enough of it left for that. Mm -hmm. Can uh, anybody guess how much of it was left? Sure. It's six minus two and three-fourths minus two and one-half. Hold this minute, Martha. Hang on just a second. Nancy, hit those lights back there, mm -hmm. would you? Sue, uh, turn that projector off and come up here and show us what you're talking about on the board. Okay. okay. But, Bill, why couldn't you just measure the tubing to find out how much is left? Martha, don't you want an example from real life? <laughs> yeah. Look, I'll pretend we can't measure, Martha. Now, look. Six minus two and three-fourths. Now, first, we'll rename 6 as 5 and 4 fourths, minus 2 and 3 fourths. That leaves us with 3 and 1 fourth. Now, take 2 and 1 half, and we'll rename it 2 and 2 fourths, and take 3 and 1 fourth, and rename it as 2 and 5 fourths. Now, that leaves 3 fourths of a foot to fix a furnace. Is that what you had left, Bill? That's what I got. You must be right. Oh, well, what can I say? Let me remind you all again how important it is to try to estimate an answer before you work a problem. It can save a lot of time. If you can trust an estimate on a test, for instance, you can get the answer more quickly. Okay, that's it for this week. I'll see you all next time. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. I got this great problem that a guy at store told me the other day. Are you ready for this one now? Yeah. Okay. If a hen and a half can lay an egg and a half in a day and a half, how long would it take six chickens to lay a dozen eggs? Now, wait, wait, wait. Does this mean that one hen can lay one egg in one day? Ah, that's too easy. Well, you all go on and figure it out, all right? I've got to leave. Well, <laughs> what, what does it mean? Right. Well, it means just what I said. Well, tell it again. If a hen and a half can lay an egg and a half in a day and a half, how long would it take six chickens to lay a dozen eggs? If a hen and a half can lay an egg and a half, well, as usual, Todd has the class and me thinking. I have a feeling we'll be hearing from him again on that problem. Okay, let's test your memory on this section of the program. How many key words did you hear that told you what operation in arithmetic you should use? Did you hear more than, less than, how much is left, compared to, greater than? These are all key words or clues that let you know that you should subtract. For example, if I told you there were six apples and I took three and asked you how many were left, you would have to subtract three apples from six. Did you hear the key words how much altogether, combined, or total? These are all clues that you should add. Now let's say Bill ran four miles yesterday, three miles today, and is going to run three miles tomorrow. Then I ask you how many miles altogether will Bill have run? Or maybe I would ask you how many miles combined will Bill have run? Did you catch the key words in the questions that told you to add how many miles Bill had run? What about Sue's shortcut? 
If the improper fraction is more than two, what does Sue do? In 13 eighths, Sue thinks 13 minus eight equals five, so 13 eighths equals one and five eighths. What would Sue think about the fraction 19 eighths? Oh, by the way, how many eggs would three chickens lay in a day and a half? Think about it. I'm Steve Wise. See you next time on Adult Math.